On the Method of Grace by George Whitfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. On the Method of Grace. As God can send a nation or people no greater blessing than to give them faithful, sincere, and upright ministers, so the greatest curse that God can possibly send upon a people in this world is to give them over to blind, unregenerate, carnal, lukewarm, and unskillful guides. And yet in all ages we find that there have been many wolves in sheep's clothing, many that daubed their untempered mortar, that prophesied smoother things than God did allow. As it was formerly, so it is now. There are many that corrupt the word of God and deal deceitfully with it. It is so in a special manner in the prophet Jeremiah's time, and he, faithful to his Lord, faithful to that God who empowered him, did not fail from time to time to open his mouth against them, and to bear a noble testimony to the honor of that God in whose name he from time to time spake. If you will read his prophecy, you will find that none spake more against such ministers than Jeremiah. In the words of the text, in a more special manner, he exemplifies how they had dealt falsely, how they had behaved treacherously to poor souls. Says he, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. The prophet, in the name of God, had been denouncing war against the people. He had been telling them that their house should be left desolate, and that the Lord would certainly visit the land with war. Therefore, says he in the eleventh verse, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others, with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. The prophet gives a thundering message, that they might be terrified and have some convictions and inclinations to repent. But it seems that the false prophets, that the false priests, went about stifling people's convictions, and when they were hurt or a little terrified, they were for daubing them over the wound, telling them that Jeremiah was but an enthusiastic preacher, that there could be no such thing as war among them, and saying to people, Peace, peace, be still when the prophet told them there was no peace. How many of us cry, Peace, peace, to our souls, when there is no peace? How many are there who are now settled upon their lees, that now think they are Christians, that now flatter themselves that they have an interest in Jesus Christ, whereas if we come to examine their experiences, we shall find that their peace is but a peace of the devil's making, it is not a peace of God's giving. It is not a peace that passes human understanding. It is a matter, therefore, of great importance, my dear hearers, to know whether we may speak peace to our hearts. We are all desirous of peace. Peace is an unspeakable blessing. But how can we live without peace? And therefore, people from time to time must be taught how far they must go and what must be wrought in them before they can speak peace to their hearts. This is what I design at present, that I may deliver my soul, that I may be free from the blood of all those to whom I preach, that I may not fail to declare the whole counsel of God. I shall, from the words of the text, endeavor to show you what you must undergo, and what must be wrought in you before you can speak peace to your hearts. But before I come directly to this, give me leave to premise a caution or two. And the first is that I take it for granted you believe religion to be an inward thing. You believe it to be a work in the heart, a work wrought in the soul by the power of the Spirit of God. If you do not believe this, you do not believe your Bibles. If you do not believe this, though you have got your Bibles in your hand, you hate the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. For religion is everywhere represented in Scripture as the work of God in the heart. The kingdom of God is within us, says our Lord. And he is not a Christian who is one outwardly, but he is a Christian who is one inwardly. If any of you place religion in outward things, I shall not perhaps please you this morning. 
you will understand me no more when I speak of the work of God upon a poor sinner's heart than if I were talking in an unknown tongue. First, then, before you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be made to see, made to feel, made to weep over, made to bewail your actual transgressions against the law of God. According to the covenant of works, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Cursed is that man, be he what he may, be he who he may, that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. We are not only to do some things, but we are to do all things, and we are to continue so to do, so that the least deviation from the moral law, according to the covenant of works, whether in thought, word, or deed, deserves eternal death at the hand of God. And if one evil thought, if one evil word, if one evil action deserves eternal damnation, how many hells, my friends, do every one of us deserve, whose whole lives have been one continued rebellion against God? Before ever, therefore, you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be brought to see, brought to believe, what a dreadful thing it is to depart from the living God. And now, my dear friends, examine your hearts. For I hope you come hither with a design to have your souls made better. Give me leave to ask you, in the presence of God, whether you know the time. And if you do not know exactly the time, do you know there was a time when God wrote bitter things against you, when the arrows of the Almighty were within you? Was ever the remembrance of your sins grievous to you? Was the burden of your sins intolerable to your thoughts? Did you ever see that God's wrath might justly fall upon you on account of your actual transgressions against God? Were you ever in all your life sorry for your sins? Could you ever say, My sins are gone over my head as a burden too heavy for me to bear? Did you ever experience any such thing as this? Did ever any such thing as this pass between you and your soul? If not, for Jesus Christ's sake, do not call yourselves Christians. You may speak peace to your hearts, but there is no peace. May the Lord awaken you. May the Lord convert you. May the Lord give you peace, if it be His will, before you go home.